Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Gray. Finding Jesus and giving Jesus away is at the very core of our identity because we know that we don't come to church. We are the church and we seek to be the church to everyone around us. Here's how we are being the church this week. Next week on February 5th, join us here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. for an evening of worship and music with Wes Hampton. Wes has been singing with the Gaither Vocal Band for 15 years and serves the Lord faithfully with his music. Advance tickets for $10 can be purchased online through Realm or by calling the church office. Tickets will be $15 the night of the concert. Social distancing measures will
Lord Jesus in heaven. The Lamb of God, slain for our sins, pierced for our transgressions, and crushed for our iniquities. Thank you, Jesus. There is no greater love than the love that you displayed on the cross, O Lord. Because of our atonement by you, we were given a second chance. And Father, I pray for those that are already believers this morning that we don't take that second chance for granted, that we live because we have been saved. We live because we have been rescued by Jesus. Lord, you are so good to us. And we worship you today. We pray that all forms of worship expressed here today would be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Y'all can be seated. In nearly 10 years of music and worship ministry, I've been privileged to work with incredible musicians. These are people who have devoted their time and musical talent to the service of the church. But among the countless musicians I've collaborated with in the church music world, none hold a candle to the tireless efforts put forth by Kim Heiss. Kim has committed her life to serving the local church through music for over 30 years, the last 25 of which have been as full-time accompanist for the First Baptist Church of Gray. She has played for numerous church productions, rehearsals, concerts, funerals, weddings, and by my estimations, over 1,500 church worship services. Remaining steadfast through church music's many adjustments over the last few decades, Kim has gracefully navigated through the sometimes uncharted waters with humility and devotion. In addition to being the church pianist for a quarter of a century, Kim has also served as accompanist for the Young at Heart Choir, Children's Choir, and the Jones County High School Chorus. Kim is far too often the forgotten church staff member, but truly is the unsung hero. I affectionately refer to Kim as half of my brain, the other half obviously belonging to my extremely patient wife. Whenever something needs to be communicated to the other musicians, more often than not you'll hear me say, Kim, what did we decide to do? To which she responds with exactly what we decided to do. In the professional orchestra world, many people are quite familiar with the conductor. He is the front and center presence, appearing to hold the group together with every wave of the baton. However, what many people do not realize is that every conductor has a right-hand man or woman known as the concertmaster. This is the most skilled musician of the group, and that person is responsible for tuning artistic directions, fulfilling instrumental absences, and constantly assisting the conductor with management. It would be easy for me to receive all the credit for Sunday morning, ex Sunday morning music executions that are flawless. And for the record, those types of Sundays are about as scarce as hen's teeth. Nevertheless, I would not be as successful as I am without the unwavering support of my concertmaster, Kim Heiss. Never afraid to approach me with a sensitive subject in an area where I may have erred, I can always be assured that Kim is not only looking out for my own well-being, but the well-being of the entire musical group and the entire church. Kim, your servanthood is a trait to be imitated. When I look at that verse on the screen, and see Peter referring to special gifts and serving one another, you come to mind, and I know I am not alone in that sentiment. We are grateful beyond words for your faithful service to God at this church for the last 25 years. Last year, I began to think of a way to properly honor and thank you for your service, and I'd like to ask you to join me here for your gift. This says, the worship and music ministry of the Georgia Baptist Mission Board recognizes Kim Heiss for 25 years of faithful service as pianist at First Baptist Church of Gray, Georgia, 1996 to 2021. A servant of Christ doing the will of the Lord from the heart. Would you show your appreciation to Kim Heiss?
for her 25 years of faithful service. Kim, if you wouldn't have a seat right there, you can use it next to Mitch or a chair down. I think he's clean. A moment ago, I mentioned that we were grateful beyond words. You may remember, Kim, when several weeks ago I asked you what your favorite hymn was, and you responded with several, but she specifically mentioned, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Since then, I am pleased to announce that we have commissioned nationally recognized composer and arranger Heather Sorensen to arrange that hymn for solo piano in your honor. Additionally, that arrangement has been published with other piano solos with cello accompaniment and was released for purchase last week. Today, I am privileged to present the world premiere of My Jesus, I Love Thee, commissioned in honor of Kim Heiss for her 25 years of faithful service to God at the First Baptist Church of Gray, Georgia.
not to show just how awful I am. She's still got to play one more song after this. <laughs> Would y'all stand once more? A couple of weeks ago, we introduced this song at the invitation time. We did it two weeks in a row. And it really just tells the entire story of um, how our hope is not in anything of this world. And it's based off the New City Catechism. Some of you may remember doing the New City Catechism. Um, what is our only hope in life and death? And that we belong, both body and soul, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I hope that you'll join us in singing this morning, Christ, our hope in life and death. <laughs> souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing hallelujah There we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Y'all can be seated. So I don't know if uh, you've been keeping up with GameStop lately. Uh, if you have invested in GameStop, GameStop stock, you, uh, you could be wealthy people right now. 
Uh, GameStop was down around, uh, oh, let's see, it was down around $10, $12 a share, and the other day it was up at $300 a share. Uh, you, you could be a very, very wealthy person right now if you've uh, been involved with GameStop at all. I've, I've, uh, don't know if you know who GameStop is. You probably will better than Second Service. GameStop is a, is a brick-and-mortar store that you can go over to Milledgeville. You can buy a video game from them. You can trade in video games. You can buy video gaming equipment. They have some other accessories, things like that, that you can get from GameStop. So that's the kind of company that they are. They've been struggling like a lot of companies. They've been struggling for Probably five years or so, I think the online gaming platforms have given them a lot of trouble. You don't have to leave the house anymore. You just plug in your money and you get a game. Don't have to have the CDs anymore. In fact, most of our computers, new ones, don't even have a CD player on them anymore. So they've been having some trouble. And uh, the way I understand this financial thing, there was this group that was going to bet, that was betting that GameStop would go bankrupt. And so what they did, which was kind of crazy to me, is they borrowed GameStop, GameStop stock. That is hard to say. Y'all need to try it. They borrowed the stock, but they borrowed 140% of all of the stock. I can't think, I don't, I don't understand how that happens that you can, you can borrow more than actually exists, but they did. And the goal was is for them to borrow it and sell it and then when the stock tanked, they could buy it cheap and pay everybody back. It's kind of like this. You sell me something for $10 knowing that it's going to break. And so you sell it to me for $10 and I buy it and then it breaks. And then you offer to pay me, to offer to pay me a dollar for it. Well, I'm glad to get it off my hands because it's broken. Well, you just made $9. And that's the kind of, that's what this thing had, this, this company had to go it, it, it's all legal, but it kind of sounds a little shady. And to make it even more shady in my mind, these big financial institutions would go on MSNBC, CNBC, Fox Business, and they would start dogging out GameStop and telling how bad a company it was and mismanaged and do everything they could to drive that stock lower and lower and lower so that they could buy it low and they could make this insane profit. Their goal really was to kill GameStop. That was their goal. But it didn't work out right. A whole bunch of small investors saw what was happening, and they said, not this time. They started buying stock in GameStop. And when you buy stock, it drives the price higher and higher. And they took what really is probably a $10, $12 stock, and they ran it up to $300. And these guys that had borrowed all this stock and sold all this stock had to pay it back by a certain time. And so they had to buy the stock at incredibly high rates of, of, of cost. And it cost these big guys billions and billions and billions of dollars. And, of course, they're not happy. They're, it's in Congress. They're going to investigate. And the SEC is going to investigate. And all these people are going to investigate. One of the reporters reported that all these small investors have changed the way the financial markets are going to work from now on. And that may or may not be true. One guy said that you really can't tell the good guys from the bad guys until it's all over and you get to look back on everything that occurred. But this much we know for sure. This much we can guarantee. A whole bunch of little people, powerless people, people who had no, had no ability to, to affect the world, they all started shining light on something that looked a lot shady. And people started taking notice. And a preacher in Gray, Georgia, is talking about it. Because these nobodies, they were described as 30-somethings that are sitting in their boxer shorts in a, at a computer in their basement, have changed the way financial markets worked. Because they shined the light on the shady. Scripture this morning comes from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. 
Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. If you've got your Bibles, please open it. It'll be on the screens, but I'd love for you to have it open in your lap. If you've got, our, uh, if you've got the journal that you can take notes in, there's definitely a place to take notes today. Uh, I mean, there's some bullet points toward the end that you're going to want to write down because it, it kind of makes sense and we kind of need to know it. So it's Revelation chapter 2. It's the first letter to the seven churches, and it's the letter to the church at Ephesus. This is what the Lord says. These are Jesus' words. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the work you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Do you all remember what we talked about in, in the first chapter of Revelation in verse 6? We said that Jesus made us priests to his God and Father. Y'all remember we talked about a priest. Priest is a mediator. You know, we use church words when we talk about that. But really the job of, the, the job of a priest is to shine the light of a holy God in a dark world. That's, that's their job. That's what a priest is supposed to do. Show the world who this God is. Shine the light of the holy God in all of the world. What did Jesus say? Jesus said in Matthew 5, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. How many of you graduated from Miss Diane Green's or maybe worked in Miss Diane Green's preschool? How many of you graduated from that? Just hold your hands up. Don't be shy. Come on. Okay, you've done it. So y'all know the song, right? You want to come and direct? No, you don't want to do the song? No. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I keep thinking I've got the tune wrong, but I think, is that, that's, that's it, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And they'd hold their little fingers up, you know, not going to let, let's see, not going to let Satan it out. I'm going to, no, not going to hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. And not going to let Satan it out. Yeah, because I'm going to let it shine. Diane's been teaching that ever since she's had a preschool to kids, which is a great thing for them to learn. Why? Because Jesus said to let your light shine, right? So right off the bat, they're learning that that is the job of a Christian. That's the job of the church. That's the job of priests is to let their light shine in a dark world so people can see Jesus. So that's the baseline. Y'all hang on to that thought. Let's talk about Ephesus for just a second. That place was really interesting to me. Ephesus was a huge city back in its day. 250,000 people lived there. It was a religious center. They had every kind of religion in the world there. All kinds of people came all the time. It was a huge tourist attraction. The Temple of Artemis was located there. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was, a, it was one of the places that people would come from all over the world to see this. Emperor Domitian, remember we talked about him, came into power in 81 AD. Domitian thought he was a god, said he was a god, got rid of the Senate. You know, he's going to tell everybody exactly how they're supposed to live. Well, because Ephesus was the religious center of all the religions, that's where he set up his temple which is kind of an interesting kind of thing because we think that John, that wrote Revelation, lived in Ephesus. And so when, so when Domitian did his thing, well, there was John. And Ephesus was a lot, of like, a lot like Atlanta, a lot like Macon. Do you all know that there is a stretch, about a half-mile stretch in Macon, where you can get your palm read, you can buy healing crystals, 
You can go across the street to the Christian church. You can go next door and store all of your stuff. Go across the street from where you store all your stuff and buy Mexican food. Go down the street and buy an acid at the drugstore and then go next door to buy barbecue for your lunch the next day, all within a half mile of each other. Just one little stretch in South Macon. That's what Ephesus, Ephesus was. All kinds of people came to this place from all kinds of places, believing and teaching all kinds of stuff. It was a very pluralistic, a very diverse society. It was a very influential place. Powerful people lived there. So John lived there in his old age. Dimension, Domitian set up his temple there for him to be worshipped. And I don't think John kept his mouth shut. I don't think he kept his mouth shut at all. John said, he recorded Jesus saying, I've come into the world as, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. I can't see John seeing all this going on around him, sitting back saying, well, we'll talk about it in church. We're not going to talk about it out in public. I see John saying, out in public, hey, this isn't right, this is what the Holy God says, this is the way life's supposed to be. And Domitian says, you don't fit here, so he exiled him to Patmos, which was only 50 miles away, and put John on that island and put him to work in the rock quarries there. That's what we think happened. So their world looked a lot like ours. And when the text opens, what's Jesus doing? He's walking among the lampstands. What is he doing there? Just see him, I mean, when you think about the picture, he's just sort of kind of ambling around the lampstands, walking around. I think he's actually doing some work while he's doing it. I think he's tending to the lamps. We've got seven letters that tell us that he's paying attention to what's going on in the church. He's tending to the lamps. He's trimming the wicks. He's making sure they've got fuel. He's watching to make sure that their lights shine. He sees what's going on. Folks, if, this, if you don't get anything else from anything else we talk about in all this Revelation study, get this part of it. Jesus is very interested in and is watching all the time what's going on in his church. He's not out yonder somewhere and we're in here doing our thing. That's, he is very active and involved in the church. He's watching. He is interested in what's going on. He wants to see it happen. We can see here, he tells them, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know what you do, he says. I know, I know how hard you work to make what happens in your church happen. I know how committed you are to making sure it gets done. I know that you live in a crazy culture and you just keep going anyway. You've not grown weary. I know you guys. I know you're not going to give up. This is commendable. You're doing good stuff in your church. Keep doing this good stuff in your church. You're working hard. You're doing great things. Don't stop. But there's something that I need to call your attention to. He says, but I have this against you. That you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Now here's the killer. He doesn't define that. You know, give me some, Jesus. Throw me a bone. Lay out in the words here exactly what you mean by that. But he, he didn't say that. You have, to kind of, you have to kind of draw it out from the text. What does it mean? What does it mean that he said you've abandoned the love that you have at first? Let me tell you a little story. When I was a little boy, I don't know, 10, 12 years old, something like that, my daddy used to take me and a few friends fishing at Factory Shoals on Sweetwater Creek. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Sweetwater Creek State Park. It's what they call it now. When I was a little boy, there was no state park there. It was just Sweetwater Creek. And we'd go down to Factory Shoals. Daddy would take us fishing. There was a bridge that we used to drive across that they've closed the bridge. You can't drive across it anymore. It's a pedestrian bridge. The way Daddy knew about, my Daddy knew about Factory Shoals is when he was a little boy, well, not a little boy, when he was old enough to be able to drive, they would drive over to Factory Shoals and swim in the creek and jump off of that bridge into, into Sweetwater Creek. And I mean, it, it, it's, they were kind of crazy, but they did that. It was a beautiful place. 
It's a wonderful place. There's, there, is an, a, there is still an abandoned and decaying Civil War factory that's there. It was opened in 1849, and when the Civil War started, it, um, it made Confederate uniforms until Sherman marched through. And when Sherman marched through, he burned it down. It was in 1864. I, it burned it down what, in 1869. 18, no, it was 1864. I got it right. When I was a kid, it was like 1966, 102 years after that. There were no fences around it. It was no park. There were no paved sidewalks. I walked inside that structure. I could touch the walls. You could, you could kind of hear, you know, all the Civil War stuff in your imagination that happened in that place. I'm telling you, it was as cool as cool can get. And then you'd walk out of that, you'd get tired of that after a while, and then you'd go down to the, to the shoals or the creek. Where the creek was, is, was, was got incredible. it wasn't really a creek, it's more like a small river. It gets really, really wide there because it's so shallow, and there's so many rocks out there. The water's just thundering and thundering over those rocks like it's thundered for thousands of years, and it's worn those rocks down. And it's worn some slick spots down in those, in those rocks, little natural water slides. And Daddy knew which ones. There was something he knew that, you know, this one's safe. You can do this water slide. This one's not safe. If you go down this one, you could drown. But, but come over here. And you'd get in there. And it, I'm not kidding you guys. It was just as smooth as it could possibly be. And the minute you sat down in it, the water's coming through so hard, it just grabs you and throws you down and snatches you into this big pool. It was phenomenal. And I can't tell you a million times, I'd say, Daddy, watch this. And I poof, boom, and he's always going, yeah, laughing about it. It was the greatest time in the world. We never fished. We just played in water. I'd give my eye teeth to be 12 years old with him again at Factory Shoals. And to have Anna and Ben and Luke 12 years old again. And all of us go to Factory Shoals with my dad so that we could sit down in that sluice and get shot down through there. And I could go, Dad, look. And they could go, hey, Paul, Paul, look. The times that we did this, I'd go back to school on Monday, and I would tell all of my friends where I was and what we did. I didn't think anything about what anybody might say. I didn't care if they had a good dad or a bad dad or no dad or if they were upset or if they were depressed. And it wasn't that I was heartless or cruel or, or thoughtless. It's that I had been to the coolest place on the face of this earth with my dad, who that day was the coolest dad on the planet. And by golly, dingoes, you need to know about it. The next time we go, when I call you up, you need to go with us. Because this is the greatest thing that's ever been. You will never have this much fun as long as you live. I miss that part of my dad. Telling you the story... When I was sitting down writing it down, it made my heart ache. This is what Jesus means when he says, the love you had at first. That's what he's talking about. It's a love that stirs the very bottom of your soul. Makes you misty-eyed when you remember it. It's not syrupy sentimentality. It's actually an ache. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You yearn, you yearn for that peace that you've had, the joy, the contentment that you've had before. What happened at Ephesus is what's happened in the church today. Evangelical church around the world, it's happened right here at First Baptist. You see, we love people to come to Christ. If you're visiting with us, we're thrilled that you're here. We love to see people join the church. The biggest rush I get as a pastor is baptizing people. I get to hear their stories, where they've come from. 
I get to baptize children. I, to watch parents' faces when I baptize their kids where they know that my kid is sealed for all eternity and I don't have to worry about them. That when I die, there is someone here who is still going to take care of my child who's going to do a better job than I did. Yeah, it makes me... Yeah. To baptize an old man and to watch his wife's eyes when I baptize him. This grizzled old bear of a man. And I put him under the water and tears are streaming out of his wife's eyes because she knows that finally, 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 I know where he's going to go. Finally. I think there, there ain't nothing better than that. The biggest rush is alive to have seen people who have lived hard lives that have been beat down over and over and over and over again to meet Jesus and you see something new come alive inside of them. You see something brand new. The testimony of drug addicts. To hear the stories. I'm telling you, when they tell you of the places that they've been and the things that you've done and you are a parent and you think about you think about how their mom and dad felt when they were out and they didn't even know if they were alive or dead and now they're here getting baptized. They know Jesus, their life has changed. They've cleaned, they bring, they're, they're clean now and the Lord's continuing to make them clean and give them a new life. Good grief, church. Man, there's nothing better. I love the stories of families who held the hands of saints as the Lord sent his angel to take that saint home. We love hearing about families who couldn't have kids. Lady up the street from me prayed forever for a child, finally gave up and got a poodle. That was a good decision. And then she turned up pregnant. But then there are others that, that can't have children, and they fight, and they cry, and they hurt and they plead and then one day the Lord says but I have these children for you they can be yours you can raise them and to see the happiness in their eyes when that happens I love that stuff I'm standing here restraining myself right now because I don't want to scare y'all to death I want to scream that's the best thing going. There is nothing better. Nobody can catch a pass that even remotely comes to the fact of watching somebody whose life was going to hell and it turns around and they are brand spanking new because of what Jesus did. It don't get better than that. That's first love. We love Jesus stories and real stories. Don't give me, ooh, I almost said something wrong. Whew. See, the filter works every now and then. Don't give me the stories where all you, hallelujah, praise Jesus, Jesus did this in my life. Yeah, that makes me sick to my stomach. What I want to hear from you is Jesus did this. Flat out, straight word, straight up truth, be a straight talker. This is what Jesus did in my life. This is where I was, and this is what made me who I am. Here's my question saying all of that. When's the last time you've heard it? I don't mean in this room. When's the last time you heard it outside this room? When's the last time you've heard people talking about Jesus somewhere other than in this house? We used to hear Jesus' stories all the time. Where'd they go? What happened? We hear them here. Don't we hear them out there? Let me tell you what happened. Happened in Ephesus kind of like that. It happens here. Preachers were told to be careful what they said from the pulpit. Don't touch politics or the IRS can take away your tax-exempt status. So if we can't talk about politics, we have to be careful about talking about the social things that are going on in our, in our country, in our world, in our community. We have to be very careful about the things that we talk about because we don't want to be offensive to society. We want to take a chance with the IRS. We need to be careful. You need to just preach Jesus, little meek and lowly Jesus, and tell good stories. 
Be careful when you celebrate Mother's Day. Have y'all thought about this? I have. Be careful when you, when you celebrate Mother's Day. Even though God ordained the family, a mother and a father together, to have children together for life, that's God's family structure, the way he set this thing up. Even though he set it up that way, be careful. Maybe take it down a notch or two or ten because think about all those women who, who can't have children, how they feel. Don't, don't celebrate motherhood so loud. Kind of be quiet about it. Do the same thing about fatherhood because, see, here's the thing about fathers. Everybody had a crappy father. You know, maybe one or two of you had a good one, but everybody's got horrible stories to tell about their dad, and you don't want to waken up those bad feelings. Even though God ordained fatherhood and made you a father, don't celebrate it too loud because somebody will find that offensive. Be careful what you say at work. You might offend someone who doesn't share your belief. It's going to cause you all kinds of troubles. Be careful at the ball field, what you say. Be careful at the school, what you say in school. You be careful with your kids. Watch what you say if you're ever interviewed for a newspaper or a television article. Be careful what you say. Why don't you people just talk about Jesus at church? See, that's where our society is. Why don't you people just talk about Jesus at church? And we played along. Because we just talk about Jesus in the church. That's what happened at the church at Ephesus. That's what's happened here and in churches all across our country. Pay attention to what Jesus said. He praised them over their doctrine. They had it going on in the church building. But lamps are made to shine. And when a lamp quits shining, when a lamp keeps working, what do you do with it? You get rid of it and get you a new one. That's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus says to the Ephesians, if you don't return to your first love, if your light doesn't shine outside of this building, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Think with me. How many churches have you seen driving down the road that are closed? How many? Look when you leave. Everywhere you go this week, look for churches that are closed. You can go to Atlanta. If you work in Atlanta, you'll see them all over the place. I told you about going up through New England when I was moving uh, Anna from Vermont back to Michigan again. Landed in Boston, drove up through New England, and I could drive through every little town that we went through. You could tell the building was a church, but it's not a church anymore. It's a library. It's a community center. It's a government center. The church went out of business. They're closed. How many little churches around in our community are going out of business? They're not out of business yet, but they're headed that way. And we say there's one of two reasons, but there's really a third. We'll say that either they got old and set in their ways and their, their worship services started looking a lot like 1950s worship services. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I've gone to churches, been invited to go to church, and people say, we want to grow, and we want to bring young people in here, and, and we want to, you know, we really want our church to go. Please open your hymn book, the hymn number 127. We're going to sing the first, the second, and the last, just like we did when I was 12. So they're just not relevant anymore. Or maybe the church went the opposite direction, and the church is absolutely too relevant relevant at this point the church the church started believing everything after all jesus is love uh, god is love right of course he's a bunch of other stuff but we're going to hang on that one and if god is love well then you believe everything and you accept everything and if you believe and accept everything you stand for nothing and nobody wants to be a part of something as magnificent as what the church has been. And so many more lives have been changed in the world because of Jesus than anything else in the world. Who wants to be a part of an organization that doesn't change anything? But see, those are the two reasons we say. The third reason is from the Scripture. is that Jesus closed the churches. Their lights weren't shining anymore and weren't going to shine anymore, so he shut them down. 
They lost their first love. They forgot about factory shoals and that feeling that they had and that understanding that they had of the one that gave them peace that changed their life. They forgot that and they got busy doing and they forgot who they were doing it for and the reason they were to do it. Let me ask you one more question. These people who are in charge of things in our country, how will they know that they're doing something wrong if there's no one there telling them what's right? How will the people in power, whether it's in Washington, D.C., or the city of Gray, or the Gray uh, 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 Jones County commissioners, How will any of these people know that what they're doing is wrong if there's not somebody there telling them what is right? How can the darkness see light if nobody's shining the light on them? Six days ago, I had no idea that multi-billion dollar hedge funds would short sell a struggling company stock and then do their best to destroy that company so the hedge fund could get rich off of somebody else's pain until a bunch of garden variety guys sitting in their boxer shorts in their basements with TD Ameritrade and Robin Hood up on their screens started buying and selling stock and showed me what a corrupt system we've got going. Six days ago, I knew nothing until they shined light on it. Why are we surprised that the world is crashing down around our heads when there's no one there to remind them what's right and what's wrong? They're not going to come inside here except for a political rally. And then they're going to say things to tickle your ears. And we'll be happy they came. Our rallying cry right now, across the country, I hear people, we're mad mad as heck, translate, we're mad as heck and we're not going to take it anymore. According to this text, that's going to get us closed down. We need to remember the one that brung us to the dance. We need to fall in love all over again. If you're ready to take notes, here it is, almost done. Three things Jesus said to fix this. Remember, repent, and return. Remember how things used to be. Not how you did things in the old days. Those are done. If you go to factory shoals and walk in the ruins like I did, you will go to jail. You will be trespassing. You don't get to do that no more. I could have picked up a brick and took it home. I didn't. I was good. You pick up a brick and you'll go to jail. Those days are done. But love Jesus the way you did in the good old days. The way you would talk about him to your family and friends, not as a battering ram, but as the one who showed you what it was like to be loved, the one who changed you. Remember how you... You didn't hesitate to talk about Jesus in those days. You didn't hesitate to mention the Bible. You didn't hesitate to stop and pray. You didn't hesitate to pray for somebody. Remember it and then repent. Now, there are four steps to repentance. We talk about repent all the time. We say repent means to turn. No, there are four steps to repentance. The first step is is that you grieve. You grieve. You mourn over what you've lost. I told you that I ached when I thought about Daddy and Factory Shoals. I mourn over that. It's gone. I can't have that back. But you can get this back. Maybe you're so young that your faith has always been throttled. You've been raised in a world and and you know where to speak and where not to speak. You've never been able to freely say what's in your heart. Grieve over that. That's a loss. Grieve over that. That's sad. That's regrettable. Grieve. Secondly, confess your grief and your sin to Jesus. And don't dress it up. Jesus knows it already. He's standing right here beside the church. He honors your pain. Don't be shy about it. When we sing later, you can come to the altar and pray. You can go home and steal away privately today. Get away from everybody 
and come back to the Jesus that you remember. The third thing is to forsake the way you're acting. Not turn away from it, forsake it. Stop throttling our faith. Now, I'm not saying to you, go to work and start preaching on the next conference call. That would make no sense. That would be ridiculous. Don't do that. But at the same time, when the moment comes that you feel the Holy Spirit stirring to say something, share what you believe. The enemy has made us believe that the world is hostile to the gospel and that we're going to get clobbered if we say it. And the world is hostile. John heard Jesus say, people love the darkness rather than the light because the works were evil. But John also heard Jesus say, lift up your eyes and see the fields that are white for harvest. How are they going to be harvested unless we go out and shine the light and harvest them? Someone's waiting to hear what you have to say about your first love, Jesus. They're waiting on you. And the fourth one is to cry out for mercy. Jesus is more real than your husband or wife, your brother or your sister, your boyfriend or your girlfriend. If you hurt them and you realize that you hurt them, you try to make it right. You grieve over the fact that you've hurt them and you want mercy from them. You want them to give you a second chance. You don't want them to treat you like you, des you deserve to be treated. Jesus is standing in the middle of us, and he's promising that if we don't return to him, he will close the church. So, Randy, I look around, I see plenty of people in, in a pandemic. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to. But I can go point to closed churches. Jesus says this too, though, Revelation 2, verse 7. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. We always think about the horrible things that will happen to us if we say something. And Jesus says that I will grant to you to eat of the tree of, the li tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Foreshadowing, Revelation chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, Bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. We're going to get there and study that one day. But the old pictures of, of, of the throne of God had fire coming out of it, remember? And now that he's put everything under his feet and got rid of everything, now we hear rivers of the, the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They'll see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. That is a happy ending. Guys, our nations need healing. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. Their solutions will not bring healing. They will bring division. Our state needs healing. I don't care if you're a Stacey Abrams fan or if you're a governor fan. They will bring division. They won't bring healing. Our community needs healing. We have the cure. We don't need to keep the cure in the house. The cure's got to get out of the house. And if you will receive it, our job is to wake up a whole lot of people by shining the light of Jesus on a whole lot of shady with the truth of the word that's what our first love is calling us to do let's pray father we do we do repent father I pray that you would I hate to ask you because it, it's not fun. 
examine our hearts and point out to us, Father, where, where we have fallen away. So that we can grieve for walking away. Because we know what is truth. Your word is truth. You have told us over and over what's true. And sometimes we've misunderstood and sometimes we've manipulated. And we've abandoned the truth or we've just ignored it. And I don't guess we abandoned, we ignored. Help us, Father. We are sorry for doing that. I'm sorry as a pastor for the times that I've not said things because I didn't want to offend people. I grieve over lost opportunities for people to hear truth that I've walked away and left them not only unoffended, but left them un unenlightened as well. Father, I pray that you forgive us, that you restore us, that you teach us once again how to love you with all of our hearts and our minds and our soul and our strength. That we would be exhilarated when we would hear the story of somebody whose life was changed. And that we'd tell the people that we come in contact with about the one that brought us to the dance. Thank you, Father. Let your light shine that all may see and make First Baptist Church that light for Jones County. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The call for us this morning is pretty simple. Church, we need, we need to hear the words of John, hear the words of Jesus. And if they apply, repent. It's that simple for us. Don't get lost in this and go, oh, woe is me. Because he talked about so many things they did right. And we do so many things right here. But he also says, don't miss doing it because you are in love with me. Search your hearts, guys. Examine your hearts. Why are we doing what we do? And if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, who else do you know that would come and teach you how to live, who would sacrifice their life and die for you? And then who could be raised back to life so that they could tell you that they have the power over life and death and they want you to follow them and live with them forever. Anybody else done that for you? No one but Jesus. I invite you this morning to trust Him as your Savior. People might have something to say about it. That'd be okay. Because He wants to change them too. Don't worry about cleaning yourself up. Don't worry about where you've come from. Don't worry about the things that you've done. You cannot sin big enough that God can't save you. Please, this morning, come to Him. I'll be standing down front if you want to talk. If you trust Him as your Savior, please tell somebody this morning. Let's stand as we sing.
Let's pray. Dear Father, I want to just thank you for this day. just want to ask that you help us all to be a light.
have a gospel conversation with someone, dear Lord. Just want to um, just thank Kim for her service to our church, dear Lord. She's beautiful music every week, and we give thanks for that. Dear Lord, we just uh, ask that everybody know that we did not come to church because we are the church. So let's go be the church. Amen.